day. My name is Samanin Jim. I'm here at the request of Venerable Simphone from Wataroon. Today we have a very special guest, Samanin Jay from Knoxville, Tennessee. <clears throat> and we'll be talking about comparative religions and mm -hmm. the different differences between traditions. Um, good day, Jay. Good day, Jim. Um, and how old are you? I'm 19. And mm -hmm. how long has it been since you've been interested in uh, Buddhist and Buddhist ideas? I guess um, I got interested in Buddhism when I was about 17. I was a philosophy student at the University of Tennessee um, and kind of got disillusioned with the, the whole attitude of the philosophy department. And I figured, you know, the basis of most philosophy starts in religion. So I figured I would start there. Um, and got into religious studies, you know, switched my major, and kind of just gravitated towards Dharmic religions, Hinduism, Buddhism, um, and really got fixated on Buddhism because it has much more of a modern appeal than Hinduism does. You know, it's difficult for, you know, what we might call modern Westerners to really engage in devotional Hinduism, um, but Buddhism is a little bit more intellectual. It's maybe some traditions are, at least. So. Uh, it's a little bit easier to relate to, you know, somebody coming from an academic background. Do you think that might be because of the uh, last 50 years of Buddhist history in the West, the mm -hmm. basically with <clears throat> Zen beginning in San Francisco and then the Tibetans showing up in the 70s and doing mm -hmm. translations of the Mahayana, is that, mm -hmm. would you say that had an influence on you? Um, definitely, you know, I got uh, interested primarily in Chan, you know, Chinese Zen, um, later on, a, a little bit in Japanese then, but uh, my teacher at university, my main teacher, uh, Dr. Rachel Scott, actually mostly studies Theravada Buddhism. She wrote a, a book on Wat Tamakai a number of years ago um, and comes here regularly, actually, to interview monks and, and continue to do studies. And she actually helped me set up coming to Thailand and, you know, staying at Wadaroon. Well, how interesting. Mm -hmm. um and well, how, when did she, do you know when she started coming to Thailand? I think about maybe 10, 15 years ago, um, and has come off and on since then, maybe once every one or two years to stay at different monasteries, and you know, really has, is, is, she's as far as I know, one of the more prominent Theravada scholars in America. That's good. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's good. A, it was a nice starting off point to come to Thailand because since she's been here so many times, she was able to, you know, she knew some of the monks at uh, Wat Mahatat and also at Wadarun, so it was pretty easy for me to, you know, get here. You know, had I tried to do it under my own power, I probably wouldn't have been able to. And how do you like Wadarun? Um, I like it a lot. It's, uh, the lifestyle is pretty nice for the most part. And how do you like uh, living as a Samanin monk? Um, what can I say? It's, it's nice. Um, the, the schedule was somewhat difficult to adjust to when I first got here, um, but uh, it wasn't particularly hard after that. I resolved before I came here to try to start sleeping on the floor and doing things like that so I would be more prepared. Um, but, you know, that's the, probably the biggest hurdle. Sleeping on the floor or just the, the early schedule in the morning? Uh, mostly the early schedule in the morning is, you know, something that I think a lot of people aren't really that prepared for, at least where, you know, where I come from in college. Probably not. Yeah, you know, the 4.30 risers don't, don't generally, you know, go to college. That's probably true, yeah. yes. The 8 o'clock classes were hard to get to, as mm -hmm. far as I could tell from the other students, although I wake up early myself. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as Buddhism is concerned, um, how have you found that the Buddhist tradition has influenced your, let's say, awareness of mm -hmm. your own insight, let's say? Um, that's kind of an, an interesting question because I, can, I come at Buddhism from two different perspectives. There's the perspective of the academic who's a student at a university studying Buddhism. And when we study Buddhism, we study it from a secular perspective, looking at a tradition. And then there's also the part of me that's, you know, you might call it the practitioner, who's been more personally involved in Buddhism. So I really got 
started in Buddhism as an academic and then moved into kind of a, a sort of practitioner's lens when I realized that some of the teachings might actually be valuable as opposed to just something to study you know, and, and know about and teach other people about because it's something to know. Well, this application of mm -hmm. the teaching certainly is the whole idea. <clears throat> In what way did you first start applying it to a, let's say, a more secular lifestyle? Um, I started out doing uh, meditation practice. You know, it's, uh, it's pretty easy to get into. There's guides all over the place. And uh, especially uh, Theravada meditation is pretty easy to do. You know, there's not, a, there's not a lot of real complex foundational practices that go into it. You can just, you know, go into Samatha or Vipassana meditation and start doing it. Um, Was that sitting meditation? Yeah, all, all sitting meditation. Um, I didn't really, I wasn't really aware of standing, walking meditation until I got here. You know, that's not something we ever really studied that much. You know, the, the classic picture all the Westerners have of the Buddha is, you know, the, the, the seated image. And uh, most of the practitioners I knew in America were mostly involved in seated meditation. And that's quiet. Yeah, definitely. Um, mostly uh, Theravada seated meditation is traditionally quiet. Um, and uh, through the martial arts community, there's also a large strain of Zen in America. So uh, I you know, maybe dabbled in some Zen meditation and for a long time didn't really appreciate maybe the finer differences. So sitting meditation was just sitting meditation to me. As you contrasted Zazen to Theravadan, mm -hmm. uh, uh, did you count breath, do breath counting? Um, not in Zazen, in the, in the sitting meditation for Theravada we did. Was that the 10 breaths? Um, generally, you sit for about 100 plus. 100 breaths? Yeah. How long did it take you to do 100 breaths? Uh, you can, I guess the first time it probably took me 20 minutes because I was really kind of hyperactive about watching my own breathing. Um, but after that, you know, you can stretch it out pretty far. You know, I've done maybe 40 minutes plus sometimes, you know, and I've really been able to be focused about it. Um, and I think that that's maybe the deeper meditation. Well, certainly it's calming. Mm -hmm. And it gives you a, certainly a very physical discipline to your meditation that, actually, for as far as I'm concerned, mm -hmm. uh, distracts you from things that aren't so important. Mm -hmm. and did you find that to be true? I think concentration meditation is useful in some respects, but also a little bit dangerous in others. Can you uh, explain that? Um, the dangerous part, I mean, as you perceive yeah. threat. I, I don't mean, you know, physically or psychologically harmful. You know, you can maintain high rates of concentration for long periods of time, um, you know, as long as you're eating regularly, you know, things like that. It's not physically dangerous, but you can get really absorbed in being concentrated all the time. You know, when you're in these really high states of samatha meditation, you're not concerned about anything. It's very calm, very concentrated. You know, the problems of the world aren't bothering you. And I think there's almost a sense where you can rely on that too much and just not engage in what's going on. Would you consider that obsessive? I don't know if I would say that I've ever met anybody who was obsessive about meditation in kind of like a psychological illness, but uh, definitely that there may be traditions that focus too much on just meditating all the time and not, you know, engaging in, you know, what Theravada Buddhists call samsara. Right, and you mentioned the benefits of mm -hmm. meditational practices. Can you uh, elaborate on that a bit? Yeah, definitely. It's, uh, it is quite calming, you know, if anybody's ever you know, tried to do breathing meditation, even if you've never, even if you're not that good at it, you know, you sit five, ten minutes, put, you know, breathe in and out, problems aren't as big as they were, you're calmed down. Maybe if you have some training in Vipassana meditation or some, your, some of your own insight from somewhere else, you apply some insight to those problems. But uh, mainly it's a really good way to distance yourself from things that are bothering you. And what gets calm? What gets calm? Well, there's a number of different answers to that question. Um, we might basically say that the mind gets calm, and then, you know, we can say, well, what is the mind? And no, I think let's stop at the mind. Yeah, we, we could say the mind gets calm, that uh, maybe thoughts and perceptions don't arise as quickly as they might if you're engaged in other activities because you don't have that much sensory input. Um, and the thoughts that do arise, you're able to maybe think about a little bit more than you're normally able to in your day-to-day -day life. So you're thinking about thoughts? 
thinking about thoughts, um, mm -hmm. what we might call mindfulness of thoughts. Okay, good. But a better, I think it's a better term, certainly mm -hmm. for the people that might be paying attention to this program. Yeah, definitely. Is mindfulness of thoughts mm -hmm. and how, how, where they come and, you know, where do they go when they're not in your head? Mm -hmm. Where do they go when they're not in your head? Well, that's kind of a... It's a difficult question for me because I don't really view it as that important. Or, listen, that's a great answer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, there's paying mm -hmm. attention to what an answer is mm -hmm. is certainly part of a meditational process. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's not important mm -hmm. it is an excellent insight yeah, into uh, this whole meditational process is you are able to distinguish between what is important and what isn't important. It's something that you haven't mentioned, but it's a discriminating um, aspect mm -hmm. of the meditational practice that most people don't appreciate. Yeah, I think definitely, you know, we can... That's one of maybe the dangers of too much meditation, is that you can get really lost in this kind of discursive world where you can follow thoughts and think about, you know, what we said, you know, be mindful and establish these things. And you can really get so far removed from, you know, what's actually going on in what we might call reality, if you won't push that too hard. Um, that, uh, you know, we, what we're doing isn't really relevant for anyone anymore. It's certainly not relevant for us because we get to a point where we don't know anymore. We're engaging in discursive thought that doesn't, doesn't really have that much meaning for anyone. It's certainly enjoyable to, you know, maybe analyze these things, but if there's no concrete benefit, you just, you're kind of just sitting there. Well, certainly you've pointed out the mm -hmm. fact that within Thailand, they actually support you in doing that, in becoming that. Yeah, there's, you know, I, I don't want to be critical of the Sangha as an institution, but uh, I think there is a, you know, maybe a bit too much focus on contemplation of things that aren't necessarily important. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly from a Western point of view, mm -hmm. we have a, an opportunity mm -hmm. to look at, let's say, different social, cultural, and meditational choices, mm -hmm. uh, maybe less, you know, culturally mm -hmm. con um, restricted, mm -hmm. simply because we don't have an idea one yeah, way or yeah. another about mm -hmm. any of these traditions, mm -hmm. simply because we don't have one uh, history of it, mm -hmm. and we don't haven't developed opinions about it. So it's mm -hmm. more uh, more finding out what's going on and then deciding without mm -hmm. a history, mm -hmm. which is a very unique position for Western monks. That um, Asian people who've grown up within a spiritual environment mm -hmm. don't have and don't uh, don't appreciate. I think. Although they get to go to the West and look at the West from an unbiased, <laughs> unhistorical point of view yeah. and are mm -hmm. able to criticize, mm -hmm. I, I think the West and the values that they have, I think, better mm -hmm. than Westerners are able to do themselves. There's actually a term for kind of that cultural consciousness, you know, East and West. Uh, it's a Greek term, mythos, that mm -hmm. uh, you might be familiar with. And really, you're, you're analyzing the practices of one mythos, you know, coming from the West. You're seeing the mythos of, say, Thailand. Mm -hmm. And you're analyzing the practices outside of the culture, you know, outside of what the mythos is. So it can be interesting sometimes, you know, to, to look at the practices yourself and then ask people why they're doing the practices. It's, yes, it's complicated. Mm -hmm. And certainly when people ask Westerners, you know, why do they like mm -hmm. the things that they do? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge, mm -hmm. uh, certainly for Westerners to explain that. In fact, it's mm -hmm. a very difficult thing to do. Yeah, it's extremely difficult to explain your own mythos because you don't, you don't know anything else. You know, the, the idea that you can step outside of it doesn't even occur to most people. It certainly takes a long time to generate even in people who would think about it. And that's what Godel did in 1931 in his incompleteness theory, talking about formal systems, mm -hmm. <clears throat> which he says is you only you can appreciate a formal system from outside the system, mm -hmm. and you can't even explain the system at all from the inside. There's yeah. always arguments mm -hmm. that are going to be undecidable mm -hmm. from within uh, any cultural or any tradition or any mythos, as it, mm -hmm. the term that you're using. Mm -hmm. And we're finding out that we are mm -hmm. 
outside the system with a discriminating mm -hmm. awareness uh, that I think is ignored. As mm -hmm. we ignore Asian criticism of our own culture mm -hmm. and decide that that criticism is I, th I think what we decide is the criticism is unjustified. Not that it isn't valid, mm -hmm. but we haven't, it's like the Western people haven't asked for that criticism, mm -hmm. as the Theravadans aren't asking for criticism either. I think <clears throat> one of the, the reasons we may tend to dismiss criticism from the East is that we view it as non-intellectual. Is that right? Um, it's certainly one of the things that I've come across in, you know, especially in, in what I understand, which is very minimal about Eastern social criticism, criticism on America, is that, you know, a lot of the people I've talked to who are involved in political science say, you know, you know this, is, this isn't coming from a rational perspective, we don't have to listen to it. And it really is coming from a rational perspective, but it's coming from a very different perspective. You know, it's coming out of a completely different cultural context, a different mythos. So, you know, I don't, you know, claim to know too much about how different mythos interact, but uh, it's difficult to accept criticism from a completely different context. Well, um, Nash, you know, the, mm -hmm. was it the movie mm -hmm. about uh, the mind? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> he, his argument was, in fact, people make decisions on <clears throat> knowing each other person's mythos, mm -hmm. and that's how you reach consensus. Right, right. And he observed this mm -hmm. in the late, early 60s, I believe. Yeah, I mean, we're definitely not <clears throat> discussing ideas that haven't had, you know, thousands of words already put down, you know, because of At them. At least thousands. Mm -hmm. You're being nice. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, mm -hmm. Okay, we have... We're looking at different cultural interpretations mm -hmm. of each other right. here, and we're actually mm -hmm. in a very unique position mm -hmm. in being both Westerners and mm -hmm. Samanese monks, certainly. Yeah, definitely. There's a, a <clears throat> certain amount of cultural expectation that comes with that. Well, from, from my point of view, I find it both very satisfying mm -hmm. that people have figured out different, a mm -hmm. different strategy. Mm -hmm. As far as I'm concerned, it's at least as wholesome, if not more wholesome, than Western ideas. And mm -hmm. that uh, they've managed to uh, make it work. I think it does work to an extent. Um, the relative wholesomeness of culture is something I don't think I can really speak on. Um, because, you know, whatever we can say about being wholesome, you know, we, we don't really have an objective, you know, we don't have something to judge it against. We don't, can't we uh, judge it against our own experience in Western culture? Um, then I would say that there are, you know, parts of Eastern culture that can learn from Western culture and vice versa. Probably. Mm -hmm. I suspect that's actually happening. I think to an extent it is. Um, mm, we're here. Yeah, definitely. We're here, you know, engaged in a tradition that doesn't, uh, you know, definitely would never evolve in the West on its own, um, and indeed has a very difficult time, you know, existing in the West. There are very few Theravada communities uh, in the West because the West isn't really set up for renunciation. Well, I think that the reason that the Theravadan communities exist in the West is because of the Thai people that support those traditions, mm -hmm. and that my experience is, is that the very few Westerners mm -hmm. that actually participate in the temples are married mm -hmm. to Thai women for the most part mm -hmm. and wouldn't get involved otherwise. And I, I find it is not... It, well, you're an exception here mm -hmm. since you're not married to a Thai woman and mm -hmm. you got involved in a Thai tradition. Mm -hmm. And I think that, uh, that we, let us talk about that. I mean, I got involved um, in the Thai tradition purely because I was interested in the Buddhist teachings. You know, I, I, I like Thailand as a country. Um, I, I think the food is fine, things like that. But uh, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the fact that this is a major Buddhist country. Um, I am not a big vacationer, so there, there, there would never be any reason for me to come here besides the teachings. Um, and that's, you know, been really my only drive to stay here, you know, has been to study as much as I can about the teachings um, and then have time to contemplate them because as monks we have tons of time to contemplate things. Isn't that different? Mm -hmm. 
I you know certainly I went to college myself, mm -hmm. and you mostly don't have time. Yeah, definitely. To do There's, anything except mm -hmm. study and go to class. Mm -hmm. There's very little time for what we might call critical thinking. I completely agree, mm -hmm. and it's it's entirely different here. And as far as I'm concerned, a very mm -hmm. refreshing difference. Mm -hmm. Uh, something that um, I find pleasant here is that if you want to be left alone, they will in leave you alone. Yeah, definitely. It is a, it is very different. Um, but we also have to think about, you know, what are we supporting by being left alone? You know, this is one of the things that I had a little bit of an issue with when I first got here was that the things I was personally thinking about Buddhism, about the Buddhist teachings, um, were not lining up with the lifestyle that's always being lived. Um, so you have to think, you know, do I, what, what am I, you know, tacitly saying is okay by, you know, living in this tradition? And is this actually, it's a marvelous mm -hmm. issue, certainly, that seems to exist in every tradition as contrasted to the spiritual application of the teachings mm -hmm. as contrasted to the traditional applications of the teachings. Mm -hmm. And there seems to me, and uh, my experience, is that there always a, is a conflict mm -hmm. between these two different categories of the same teaching. Definitely. I think that you could, you could almost talk about two different Buddhisms. You could talk about maybe traditional Thai Buddhism, and then you could talk about the Buddhism of the Buddhist teachings. Um, which for Theravada is found in the Pali Canon, you know, in other sources in different, different sects of Buddhism. But uh, those things are very different, and I think it's a huge misconception that they're always related um, in any way. Now, this difference, and I, I like to talk about the difference mm -hmm. between tradition mm -hmm. and s the spiritual process. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and for the most part, I'm not a traditionalist. Mm -hmm. I'm a mystic. Right. Which puts me into more mm -hmm. the Hindu category of yogi. Mm -hmm. um, and the, even though the traditionalists will tolerate mm -hmm. um, that uh, meditational lifestyle choice, it's not a typical choice. Yeah, that is, that is definitely true. You know, traditional Thai Buddhism has, has forest monks, but uh, even forest monks, you know, correspond, you know, and have, you know, very strong things to do in the tradition. You know, they have obligations within traditional Thai Buddhism, even though they're viewed as maybe more renunciant than city monks. Well, I think that from what I can tell, mm -hmm. and the forest monks that I was able to visit certainly in 1980 when mm -hmm. I was tested mm -hmm. by the Supreme Patriarch and mm -hmm. by the forest monks in uh, Chiang Mai, is that the forest monks actually live a more rigorous life mm -hmm. and, uh, than the traditional monks. Oh, definitely. You know, they take the, I think it's a tudong in Thai. It's a, a certain number of additional ascetic practices in addition to the 227 precepts. Um, how valuable those practices are, I don't know. You know, I have become relatively critical of asceticism since I've been here. Well, my experience mm -hmm. with uh, being a forest monk, mm -hmm. turning in Renong for a year, is that there's certainly forest monks that do mm -hmm. do the hard practices or the mountain monks. Mm -hmm. There's a whole bunch of them that no one ever finds out about that don't do that. Really? I didn't know that. They get away from the monasteries mm -hmm. and the temples as fast as they can mm -hmm. and find a place to go to be left alone mm -hmm. to do their own practices. And what I've discovered is no one knows what they do. Mm -hmm. And they don't tell anybody mm -hmm. what they do. And they disappear into the, into the bush and come out every week or 10 days or six months or whatever mm -hmm. to get food or whatever. And then they disappear again. Mm -hmm. This is a, and there's, well, no one I think really knows how mm -hmm. many of these kind of forest monks they actually are because they disappear. Yeah, there's no, uh, there, you know, out, outside of, you know, the monastic ID cards and things like that. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. they don't write anything, mm -hmm. they don't talk to anybody, and no one can find them. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it makes them pretty gone. Yeah, definitely, there's a, I, I think it's totally believable that there's a strong, what we might call a mystical element that doesn't get talked about. That's, well, certainly I was able to stumble across that, mm -hmm. but you actually do have to wander off. Mm -hmm 
and, and even in the United States, mm -hmm. uh, in Arizona, it's called jungling up on the Colorado River. Mm -hmm. And certainly we don't have a spiritual tradition, and we certainly don't have support for these. Mm -hmm. But at, when I did jungle up on the Colorado River, mm -hmm. uh, you could walk through those auroras and uh, other places that were like five miles away from the road. Mm -hmm. And there were people out there. Yeah, definitely. Um, where I live in, in Knoxville, in Tennessee, uh, there's the Smoky Mountain Range, mm. which is a, a series of not too treacherous mountains. And there are a lot of people who live in the National Park or who, uh, you know, migrate in between, you know, Tennessee and North Carolina who are, you know, maybe what we would call in America backpackers, but who would, you know, whatever they're thinking, they'd easily be considered mystics here. I think that they're mystics there. Mm -hmm. uh, but oddly enough, they were, most of them were engineers from Los Angeles, mm -hmm. which I found just uh, really surprising. Mm -hmm. And it turns out these people are not stupid people. No, they're, they're not. You know, there's a, a common misconception uh, that people who are, who are homeless or people who are you know, migrant like that um, are doing it you know, because they're addicted to drugs or because you know, they're too stupid to work. Or, but, you know, I've come across people um, all over America. You know, I don't have much international travel under my belt, but definitely all over America who are highly educated and have made this as a life choice. I have found the same thing. Mm -hmm. Of course, I was there myself, mm -hmm. very well educated, by the way. Yeah. And that stupid people can't do this. They don't survive well out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, they don't know what to do. They are mostly bored. Mm -hmm. The other people are not bored for different reasons, certainly mm -hmm. not traditional reasons, but uh, as far as I'm concerned, spiritual reasons, although mm -hmm. they don't normally s argue in that way, in that vein. Yeah, I think that uh, spirituality is a really loaded term in the West. Um, and I think that that happens maybe to an extent because of the inundation with Eastern religions we had in the 70s. Um, and things, you know, words like guru mean different things. You know, people think of Jim Jones and the Kool-Aid, mm -hmm. things like that when you say guru, you know, new age spirituality, alternative spirituality. Um, you know, these mean different things in America. By the way, I met James Jones. Really? Early on in his priesthood, and mm -hmm. he was excellent. Mm -hmm. He was an excellent healer. He was mm -hmm. an excellent man. Mm -hmm. He did re very good things mm -hmm. in his early ministry, and mm -hmm. he helped people out that no one else would help out. Mm -hmm. He was an inspiration for the first couple of years in his mm -hmm. ministry. And then what happened is that people started just running energy into his head, mm -hmm. and the Protestant tradition, the fundamentalist Protestant tradition at the time, was basically unable to mm -hmm. manage that, and they didn't know what to do from mm -hmm. a uh, you know to avoid that getting into your head. Yeah, there's a reason you put your head forward when mm -hmm. you're meditating, is so that energy doesn't go there, mm -hmm. because you, one it doesn't fit, mm -hmm. and two, it doesn't fit, and mm -hmm. so in that regard, we have a conflict mm -hmm. and what happened it drove him crazy which is very sad and very tragic outcome yeah um, definitely I had known uh, only a, a real little bit about his early history um, okay. but uh there we ah yes we better wrap it up mm -hmm. and I want to thank you very much for coming in today mm -hmm. and having this conversation about spirituality and tradition in your ex early experiences in Thailand mm -hmm. I want to thank you for, for attending or uh, watching uh, this uh, film. And uh, if uh, you're interested in picking uh, up this book on Buddhist humor, which I wrote with, for uh, Venerable Symphone, uh, please contact